Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former health commissioner here in Baltimore. Our goal is to bring evidence and experience to illuminate critical public health issues. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call. Today, Dr. Tom Inglesby, director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, joins Dr. Josh Sharfstein to talk about, wait for it, COVID. They discuss everything from the situation in the U.S. and the world this fall to how they themselves are managing their own lives. Let's listen. Tom Inglesby, it's good to see you and ask you about the state of COVID here in September 2022. Great, Josh. It's good to be back with you. So where would you start? How would you explain to, let's just say, a Martian landing on planet Earth where things stand now? Yeah, well, I think there is a lot of good news in the directions that we're heading. We're seeing within the prism of the United States in general, we're seeing things move in good directions. Overall case numbers are trending downward. Hospitalizations are trending downward. Deaths are beginning to come down after being stubbornly um, uh, far too high for far too long. Um, And if you look across the country, all the numbers across the different regions of the country are all moving downward, some faster than others. There are some there are some uh, dark spots, though, in the overall story and some important warnings that we have to kind of continue to keep front of mind. There are a couple of states that still have rising case numbers. For example, South Carolina, Missouri, Texas this week have numbers moving in the wrong, the wrong direction. Not by a lot, but um, but they're not following other trends. Um, uh, we've also uh, we also know that there are people. You know, there's still even with numbers coming down, there's still somewhere in the order of 375 people dying every day from COVID. That is a very high number if you compare it to other leading causes of death. It's still up there, depending on how you look at it. Um, if that were every day of the year. That's a top 10 cause of death in America. And um, there are still somewhere 30% of the country, depending how you count, of the country hasn't been vaccinated and is and is quite vulnerable to COVID. And so I think even if even as we have to have a couple of things in our minds at the same time, we have to we we want to acknowledge the positive trends and the fact that we have more tools than we've ever had. We have antivirals, we have a variant booster vaccine. We have adequate supplies of masks. We have lots of tests, but we still have a lot of the country that's quite vulnerable. We have an immunosuppressed population, an older population. Uh, so we have to make sure we do what, what we need to do, what we can do to protect the vulnerable. And uh, hopefully we keep making progress, but um, also stay prepared for the possibility of unexpected turns in the future and the possibility of a surprise variant that we don't see on the horizon right now. So that is, from your vantage point, looking at the U.S. situation, um, it's really important for those cautions and warnings and and extra efforts to be taken. Um, This is a moment in the United States, though, where There's a lot of looking past the pandemic going on. Um, There's not much you can do if people aren't interested in in paying attention. How does that factor into your assessment? Yeah, I think that is is definitely the reality. Uh, What you just described, I think many, many people, the great majority of the country, I think, is ready to certainly to move on. It's been a, a very hard couple of years. And many people are in a a much, much safer position than they were. They've been vaccinated three times, four times. Hopefully they're gonna get vaccinated shortly with uh, this variant booster that's just been approved. And we have antivirals out there as well. So I think 
optimism around the pandemic is warranted for many. Uh, you know, we can hope that things will keep getting better, but as a country, we we can't just um, um, assert or or hope that the pandemic is behind us. There are lots of vulnerable people still out there living in our communities, and COVID is still circulating in the world and capable of generating new variants, which could be much more dangerous. And our policymaking process right now at the federal level is really, has also unfortunately moved on, even though the administration continues to seek resources from Congress, including in this kind of this new request to add funding to the continuing resolution that Congress will hopefully pass at the end of this month. Uh, Congress has not showed a lot of interest in, in continued support for COVID preparation. And I think that puts us at real risk in the future should we have unexpected changes in direction. For example, last year, moving into November, things were looking good. Trends were moving in the right direction. And without much notice, we had the sudden arrival of the Omicron variant. And fortunately, at the time, we had substantial resources left uh, to deploy for kind of the, the the high numbers of cases that were coming in around the country, uh, but it was still very challenging. At this point, the administration has conveyed to Congress we are uh, really running low on resources around COVID, uh, but they're not getting a lot of reaction from from Congress around that, and we just we can't. The same policymakers who were saying a year ago. We can never be in this position again. We can't be so vulnerable to new changes in COVID. Those same folks are now not supporting continued work to prepare ourselves. And I think that's a big mistake. Yeah, and uh, you can imagine that if a new variant were to arrive, they might be the first people to say, why weren't we better prepared? I think that is the dilemma, right? It is the, it's the challenge is that it, it, if we wait until there is something new upon us, uh, in the past, our warning has been on the order of a few weeks, and we can't wait for that kind of short timeline to be able to build up a stockpile of tests to be able to, you know, continue to provide the unvaccinated with access to vaccine and antivirals to make sure that we have testing widely available. That we just have to keep doing work to diminish the overall consequence of COVID and to get ready for any twists and turns in the future. Now, some people have recommended. Um, combining COVID, at least in our mind, with influenza and other respiratory pathogens to kind of report on them together, to advise on precautions on them together, to kind of, on the one hand, move past COVID as a unique entity, but on the other hand, keep COVID high of mind because we're now going to, you know, get the respiratory pathogen report along with the weather report. Do you think that's possibly a path to more attention to COVID without feeling like we're under siege, which I think people have decided they don't want to do anymore. Yeah, I do think that is the direction we should be going. I think, you know, the, the extent that we can build it into our normal systems, and first of all, it makes it makes it less controversial. It's more of our kind of our standard you know, approach to keeping people safe, healthcare, public health. Uh, so, so setting some kind of expectation around the possibility of an annual COVID booster, I don't. I think it's too soon to say for sure that that's the that's the cadence. But kind of beginning to think about that in the way that we think about influenza does make sense. Um, I think there is the administration has has signaled, and many others have signaled that we're working to try to, you know, the U.S. is working to try to move this to the regular. Uh, process of coverage through Medicare, health insurance, Medicaid, away from these special programs, and probably in the end, that's that is going to be a good thing. And you know, you don't want to have to go and ask America to go in for one shot one week, and then two weeks later go back for another shot altogether. So if we can get these things done at the same time, in the way that you know we do for pediatric vaccines, we get things done, multiple things done at once. That'll be a good thing. Um, I think, you know, right now we're just, it's probably logistically now possible to get those things done on the same day. You can see pharmacies 
when you go to sign up for your new COVID vaccine booster, they prompt you right away to say, would you like to get your flu shot the same day? Uh, so I think moving towards something that feels a little bit more regular, a little bit less, you know, peaks and troughs is a good thing. But we just have to acknowledge there could be surprises which may require things that are not that are off schedule. Uh, but for now, it looks like moving in that direction would make a lot of sense. I want to ask you um, for a minute about the global picture. Um, we've talked a lot about about the U.S. How do you feel about the world situation? Uh, yeah, you know, um, I think good news first, it does look like for the most part, you know, trends are moving in the right direction around the world, uh, as they are in the U S but that's kind of at a very average, you know, kind of taking the average of the world. There are still places that are suffering worse than others. Um, and it's still the case that a, a small minority of the world's countries have had access to a majority of the tools that we have to fight COVID. So we should be doing, we should continue to be doing all that we can to move vaccine to low and middle income countries, to make antivirals accessible to low and middle income countries, uh, especially now that we have moved into a time where we have variants that are probably, you know, far better suited for uh, circulating strains that we see. And um, unfortunately, on the U.S. side, just as Congress has not supported the domestic COVID response needs, they also have not shown a lot of interest in supporting ongoing U.S. support for international COVID response efforts, which I really think is a mistake. We all, I think we all now see that a variant that arises in a remote part of the world and spreads there is going to be here in the U.S. at some point. It probably already uh, is by the time it's recognized. Probably already is, and it'll be coming a lot faster. So uh, it just makes a lot of sense for us to be doing what we can as international community, the countries that have the most resources, especially now, now that there are no shortages, um, typically, I mean, that's, that's gross generalization, but now that there is a lot of supply of these products in the world, we do have, we should have an obligation, a moral obligation, a practical one, operational, to get uh, products to, to the rest of the world so that we can continue to lower the consequences of COVID and lower the chances of new things happening that, that are bad for the world. Can I ask you about China? Yeah. So China seems to be quite an outlier right now. Um, really aiming for zero COVID, even with these variants that are extraordinarily contagious. Um, and I guess you can see the pictures and read the news stories about all of the challenges that the country has had, you know, with multiple um, actual lockdowns. Sometimes that term is thrown around kind of loosely, but I don't think so in this case. Um, right. What do you think is going on there and, and how would you advise them to approach, you know, this fall and, and into 2023? Yeah, it's a, it's a really difficult situation for them at this point. Um, they, like other parts of the world, they have a substantial portion of their population, including a lot of very vulnerable people that have not been vaccinated. And so um, I think they see, they, I mean, they have operated in this way, this kind of zero COVID position since the beginning, but the risks have in many ways grown over time um, because now we have a more contagious virus and we have a, there are a large number of people who are unvaccinated. And so I think they're quite worried about the consequences of kind of the scale of that. And I think the, the way out of that uh, ultimately is a, a much more intense, um, you know, effort to to vaccinate those who have not yet gotten vaccinated and um ultimately to begin to ease their way out of it i don't i don't you know they're really operating in in a way that no other countries in the world are operating and i think it is you know frightening people there it's kind of limiting their ability to re-engage with you know other parts of the world um and uh, I mean, they have obviously very particular problems given the, 
the lack of immunity that has developed over time from infection, which has been a very sad and hard way for the world to get immunity. But a lot of the rest of the world has had some level of immunity through infection and a lot of immunity through vaccination. And I think they need to figure out a pathway to move in that direction. And because this this process that they're they're in now is this recurring, I, I would say is a kind of a recurring lockdown nightmare for many parts of China. And it just doesn't seem, I mean, I suppose it's sustainable. They they have a very powerful operation there, but it just seems like it's it's uh has such a tough downside for them to continue like this that I that I'm hopeful that they can bridge to a to a time when they have much better vaccination coverage and a kind of a gradual easing so they feel like it's less all or none lockdown or open. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, end with some questions very close to home. So here we are, um, every one of us having to make decisions about what to do for ourselves and our families uh, this fall. Um, I have to tell you, I'm, you know, out and about a lot more than I used to be, Mm -hmm. say a couple of years ago, but you know, I carry a mask in my pocket and I'll put it on if I'm around a lot of people indoors. I would say I kind of scout out the restaurant if I'm going to eat indoors. I generally would much prefer eating outdoors. So it's for me personally, like still affecting my decisions because mm-hmm. I really would like to avoid getting COVID if I can. But there are also um, a lot of parents who are concerned about uh, their kids getting COVID in school and wondering about whether they should be in masks. How do you put these sort of decisions into context? What, what's the advice that you give? I, I can imagine for every call I get from someone, you probably get 10. Yeah, I mean, they are hard decisions that people are making. They're kind of coming to, you know, learn learn to live with COVID in different ways. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I, I have a similar, just on a personal level, I have a similar approach to, to so it sounds like you're how you're approaching the world. I I, uh, I continue in larger indoor spaces um, to wear a mask because I don't want to get COVID. I'm not particularly concerned. I've been vaccinated. I've had COVID. I'm not very highly concerned that I get sick enough to be hospitalized in the future. But I'd rather not get COVID or give COVID to others if I do get COVID. So I will put on a mask, um, but not always. I mean, we have been to some indoor restaurants, but I I'm less comfortable doing that than I am eating outdoors. Um, and I know there's a spectrum of response in public health. Some people are are further along um, in, in kind of resuming more normal activities. I think um, for schools, uh, the schools are, I think, have largely moved towards any kind of consistent with CDC approach, or many schools have moved in the direction of asking their students and their faculty to be up to up to date on vaccines, stay home when sick. If if they're prepared or many schools are prepared and are advised to consider putting masks on when the incidence of community COVID is high enough uh, to um, warrant that, but um, to take them or to, to not require them when community spread is low. And I think that's that's been CDC's recommendation for some time, and schools are kind of adjusting to that. And that means right now uh, that many, many places in the country, the majority of places in the country, are not advised to wear masks. And um, I think many families, when you kind of look at the risks to kids overall who have been vaccinated, some of whom have also been infected and have accepted that level of risk. Uh, and considered to be very low at this point, given vaccination and infection, prior infection. Uh, and some have not, or have kids who are um, more vulnerable for whatever reason. They've either live, they're either more vulnerable themselves, either immunosuppressed, or live with a family member who's, who's more vulnerable. And those kids will, you know, have been asked by their parents to continue to wear masks. And I think we just need to be very supportive of that part of our community. There will be a group of people in our community that will continue to wear wear masks for some time, and I think we should be absolutely supportive of that. And many others will um, kind of have have come to the judgment that it's it's reasonable for them not. And I think we're in this time where we have to accept both. This is kind of what it's like for COVID to move from the center of all of our 
thinking to a disease that we live with. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, we wondered what that would look like. That's true. You're right. That is true. And we'll probably see new variations of that as we go in the, in the next year. But you're right. This is the version that we're living with now. And um, hopefully it continues to move in this direction and uh, it gets to be less of a burden on society. That's, I think, what we all hope we'll have to see. And oh. well, we'll be here to talk about it either way. Thank you so much, uh, Tom. Really appreciate your joining. Thanks for having me, Josh. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Holes-Fernandez and Amber Bryan-Singletary. Thank you for listening.